Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the 10th lecture of Spatial Statistics and Spatial Econometrics. In today's lecture, uh, we are going to sort of shift gears uh, to working with data. And, and any time that you work with data, the first step is exploratory analysis. So what you really, uh, you know, ought to do is to be able to summarize these data or explore, you know, conduct an exploratory analysis um, intelligently so that you can start to discover patterns that, uh, you know, uh, that are in these data, right, in the data that you're working with. What do we typically do when we sort of do exploratory data analysis? Uh, we begin by plotting histograms, you know, we try and look at the shape of the distribution, you know, is the, are the data symmetric in their distribution? Are they skewed towards the right or skewed towards the left? That is to say, are there more extreme outlier values on the right hand side of the distribution or the left hand side of the distribution, right? Uh, we also summarize by documenting the mean, uh, the sample mean, the sample variance, the minima, the maxima, the fifth percentile, the 95th percentiles, things that you have heard of. Uh, till now in this course, uh, you know, um, uh, already, okay. We want to now sort of understand when we, when we get data that are georeferenced, that is to say that they have, uh, you know, location coordinates. I mean, they could be, you know, uh, lat long coordinates, they could be simply XY coordinates, you know, you may not be working with, with data that are necessarily geotagged. Uh, but they have some tag of a location, right? Um, whenever you get data that are locationally or spatially delineated uh, with whatever, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, um, spatial system that is used to, to create these coordinates for these data in, in, in the dimension that you are working in, um, how do we go about conducting what is called as the exploratory spatial data analysis, right? How would it be different from, you know, a typical exploratory data analysis? Um, obviously, you know, as a first step, you know, location is going to become a, you know, a marker to which you are going to summarize the data, right? So now your means and your, you know, your, your variances are not just sample means, but there are sample means in the east-west direction versus the north-south direction and so on and so forth, right? Um, because we are studying data analysis, we have to start with an example. Uh, so let's do that and go step by step, look at uh, what do we look at when we, when we try and sort of summarize, uh, you know, uh, uh, spatial data in terms of, uh, you know, exploration. So here, I want to sort of, you know, uh, um, first of all, these, uh, you know, uh, the example that I'm, the case that I'm going to use to, to, to introduce exploratory spatial data analysis is adapted from uh, the book written by Noel A. Cressy, which is a 1993 uh, publication. Uh, it is also a reference book for this course. So, um, you know, you can go back and you can read chapter two of this book. You must read, uh, you know, uh, the the first and the second chapter at least of this book. Uh, it is a very well written book. However, it's a bit technical. Uh, so the job, one of the jobs that I do through this course is to make this book a little bit more accessible to you as and when you start to read it, right? So let's look at the example that Cressy presents in order to, uh, you know, explain to us what is exploratory data and spatial data analysis and how to go about it. So Cressy takes his example of coal ash data. So what we are looking at is, uh, is locations where we have 
uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, samples of coal ash volume. So coal ash is the type of impurity in 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 uh, you know when 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 one wants to mine coal from beneath the ground. You don't really know, you know, how much coal do, can be found just right beneath where I'm standing. And, you know, in this area, you know, what is the quantity of coal? What is the quality of coal? Um, and, and, and one has to be able to estimate this quantity and quality characteristics of coal uh, beneath the ground before one invests in, you know, pulling the earth out and, and, and engaging in mining. Remember, coal mining projects are, you know, uh, often multi-decade projects, right? So when you go in, you really are going to be spending uh, a lot of capital uh, in in terms of uh, you know uh, uh, you know mining that coal. So uh, what one does is that you know if one has to explore whether or not there is coal beneath any particular region uh, that we that we can look at, and what is the quality of that coal, right? I mean you may have a lot of coal, but if it is uh, you know not so good quality, perhaps you want to sort of prioritize mining in a different area where you have very high quality coal, right? Uh, so, here is an example of a region which has been sampled for coal, right? And, and, and these crosses that you see on your screen are locations where, uh, you, know, uh, you know, cores are dug into the ground and, uh, you know, earth is brought out so that you can get samples of coal uh, that will provide you an idea of how much coal is available and of what quality, right? Now, the first thing that you notice here the first thing that we notice here is that we cannot get sample of every location in space. That is to say that we cannot be digging holes at every location in space, right? We can only dig these holes at locations where we see these crosses, right? So we only know what's happening beneath the ground at locations where we see these crosses. Everywhere else we do not see these crosses, you know, where we have not cored or we have not sampled, we are still blind to it. Right. So although I might get a very good idea of what's happening at uh, this cross, which I have circled with a red circle or some of these crosses, I will have no idea what's happening in the region around this, uh, these red circled crosses. And this is one of the roles of spatial statistics. This is one of the places where spatial statistics came into being is to be able to predict the quality and the quantity of coal beneath the ground where it has not been sampled using information from where it has been sampled. That is the crosses by themselves. So the idea is that, you know, we cannot go out and actually sample every location in space. It is extremely costly. It's almost nonsensical. It's one of the reasons why, you know, uh, when, uh, you know, uh, uh, India does its uh, decadal census, you know, it can only sample certain percentage of population. It, it is not possible to go out and, 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 and collect data, survey data from every individual in India or every household in India, right? It's extremely costly and it's going to take a lot of time. Probably you will never be able to finish such an exercise. So we try and get a sample of some, you know, people and our sampling strategy is usually smart, intelligent, it's driven by science and using that sample, we try and make inferences about the population. Okay. Similarly in space here in this example, you are sampling certain points on the ground and you are leaving others out. But when you sample these ground points on the ground, the idea is the purpose is that I should be able to predict what's happening in the region, in the larger region using these many samples. Uh, you know, sample points on the ground, right? If nothing, if nothing, I should at least be able to say what's happening in, you know, spaces within a smaller domain where I have was not able to sample, although I have a very good sample. I mean, I think these are 294 sample points, if you read the book. So around 300 sample points, uh, but that's not sufficient. I mean, if I were to sample every point, I mean, there will be very large value, very, very, very large value, right? You can, you can, you can dig here, you can dig here, you can dig here, you can keep digging, uh, you know, as much as you, uh, as you would like, right? So, so, so that's where spatial statistics comes in. And the, as a first step, we want to sort of look at the data, summarize the data with the final objective 
that we will be able to predict what's happening in the region beneath the surface so that we can make these decisions, production decisions whether to go in or maybe move to a next location. Okay, uh, so coal mining industry, oil exploration industry, uh, you know, and, and, and such, uh, you know, is where, uh, you know, most of the genesis of geostatistics uh, really comes from. Okay, so here is uh, another, uh, you know, uh, visualization of the data. This visualization is now happening in, uh, in 3D in 3D, now your west direction, which we saw on the map is now, let's say it's, it is the x axis and the north direction is, let's say the y axis and the z axis or the z axis, uh, which is the height is giving me a, uh, a, a, you know, the content of coal ash that is found at the sample that was drawn at each location on the on the ground, right? So my west is my x-axis, north is my y-axis, and I'm looking at a height from ground to sort of you know uh, identify uh, the percentage coal ash. Of course, the larger the value of coal ash, higher the impurity, and perhaps uh, the lesser the desirable uh, lesser desirable this you know uh, uh, coal mining project will become. Right. So let's move forward in the quest to summarize these data. So in the next step, what is being done is that this look, this 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 orientation in which the data were originally, uh, you know, procured, it is then sort of you know uh, 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 reoriented in our typical row versus column or x y, you know, direction that we are very used to. Right when we when we study, uh, uh, you know, uh, the graphs, we we are very used to the x-axis and the y-axis. So we sort of reorient the original data set to to be represented with rows along the y-axis. So rows along the y-axis and columns along the x-axis. Indeed, the data were sampled in rows and columns. Right, they were just you know in an orientation in space that we could simply sort of, you know, uh, uh, change a little bit and it gives us a very nice x, y orientation to start working with. Another thing in this representation is that instead of simply putting a cross, what we are putting are the values which represent percentage coal ash at that location, right? So at column 14 and row 23, the coal that is that was dug out or that was sampled had 9.99% uh, of coal ash, right? Uh, at, in column one, row 14, you had slightly higher percentage of coal ash, which is 10.21%. There are some locations where, you know, the coal ash percentage is quite high. I mean, we can go back and check. I mean, we saw a very high number here, which was closer to 17.6. Of course, that is to be found in the data set as well. You know, in column five and row six, you have this value 17.61, which is a quite high level of percentage coal ash, especially if you look at the samples around this particular location, right? If you go uh, one step uh, 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 north of this location, you have 10.96. East is 10.87, South is 10.8, and, and West is 10.82. So somehow 17.62 seems like an aberration, right? So straight away, there is this inquisitiveness that arises when we start to look at the data closely, right? And we would want to then discover patterns in these data that, you know, uh, that, that provide us, uh, you know, information about the coal uh, you know, uh, uh, that is available beneath the ground in the region of study, right? Um, another thing one can do is that one could have a, one could have a sample mean. So if I were given a non-spatial data, I will simply take all these values, sum them up and divide it by the total number of observations. I'll get, I'll get a sample mean. Here, you can get a mean which is row by row. You can get a mean for row 23, for row 21, for row 20, all the way through row 1. 
and you can get a separate mean for column 1, for column 2, for column 3, column 4, column 5, column 6 and so on and so forth. So now you are getting these mean values in east-west direction and north-south direction which are different, right? So this is, this right away introduces the spatiality of the data which is the spatial dimension of the data to summary statistics. Just like we are, we are evaluating means for different rows and columns, we might as well evaluate the mode, the median, the variance, the min, the max, and the 95th and the 5th percentile or other percentiles of our interest, right? So interestingly, when we look at the data right away, we are able to sort of, you know, uh, see these uh, 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 dimensions uh, play out. So as a next step, uh, you know, what we start with is what we call as detecting outliers. And I'm saying detecting outliers one, that is to say that's the first step towards detecting outliers. What I have here, here is call it, called as the stem and leaf plot, which perhaps was the, you know, traditional version of a histogram. So if you look at the stem and leaf plot, the way it sort of turns out is a skewed, you know, a uh, 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 bell curve, pardon me for my, uh, you know, uh, bad drawing. But if you were to sort of take this bell, uh, this, this, this vertical stem and leaf plot and just rotate it to a, uh, you know, horizontal stem and leaf plot, it'll start looking like a density function or even something like a, a, a histogram, correct? So, so the stem and leaf plot, first of all, is just like a histogram. The second is, second thing is, how is it actually constructed? So the stem and leaf plot is constructed by taking each value in my data, rounding it off to the first decimal order. So let's say I have 11.17, that'll become 11.2. I have 9.92, which will just be 10. 10.21, which will be 10.2. I have 10.14, I'm gonna call it 10.1. Then I have 10.82, which is 10.8, 10.7, 9.9, 11.3, and so on and so forth. So we collect all these values and we go from the smallest value, say six, okay? And we go and figure out, do I have six with decimal entities 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, 6.5, and 6, so on and so forth. I have in this entire data set, you can search and you will find there are no values of percentage coal ash being as low as 6%, right? So minimum that we see is 7% in this data. So in front of six, we have nothing, no entry. In front of seven, when we move on to seven, we see 7003. That means in my data set, I'm going to have an entry which is going to be 7.0, another entry with 7.0, and then another entry with 7.3. I will have entries, three entries of value 7.6, one entry of 7.7, .7, and then four entries of, or five entries of 7.8, and then two entries of 7.9. And you keep on going. When you collect or organize or summarize your data in this fashion, you have a, uh, you know, uh, uh, a stem, which is all the values in front of the decimal point, and uh, on the left hand side of this, you know, uh, of this, of this uh, stem and leaf plot, which is called as the stem. And the values on the right hand side, which is a collection, which is a frequency count using the decimal values, the first order decimal value on the right hand side of the decimal point is called as the leaf portion of this stem and leaf plot. Like I said, we can simply draw a histogram and we will get the exact same uh, understanding of this entity. The histogram that we build should be sort of binned with, you know, bin sizes of 0.5. So I should have 6.0, 6.5, 7.0, 7 7.5, 8.0, 8.5, keep going all the way to 17.5 and 18, right? And now if you do want to do a frequency count and draw a histogram of, of these data on this value, you will get an exact representation that the leaf and st uh, the stem and leaf plot is providing in the vertical orientation, right? So you can replicate this. It'll also be uh, helpful to understand what a stem and leaf plot is. Uh, 
So using the stem and leaf plot, what we are able to understand is that the density of these, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, values, uh, density of these data seems to be skewed towards the right. So, you know, you have a very high value of 17.6, then you have some values at, at 12 and 13, and then most of the values are really sort of starting to pick up on the left hand side at 11. Uh, you have a mean around, uh, you know, 9 and 10. So, you have a, a large sort of distribution mass around there and then it starts to decline and this sort of dies out uh, to the right, okay. I have done, I have not done a good job of, of plotting the histogram, but the density will be skewed to the right. I think I should, uh, I should redraw this, uh, sorry about that fumble. So, uh, the, the, the histogram, if I were to draw it, it will look something like the following. So you'll have your 17 point, uh, you know, 5 uh, somewhere here and you'll have your, uh, you know, 6 here, your 7s here and so on and so forth, okay. So the mode and, uh, and the median probably will be, you know, uh, this one of the centrality measures will be around 9 or 10, so be probably 9, I think that's where the, the height becomes the largest, right. Um, 9 or 9.5 will probably where you will find the median of these data, uh, you know. So we know for a fact that the data are right skewed, they are asymmetric, of course they are right skewed, so they are asymmetric in nature and, uh, you know, it is likely that the mean of coal ash value will be greater than the median because it is right skewed. So your mean might sort of come out to be around, I do not know, 12 or 13, uh, you know, that is going to be the mean. The median is going to be shorter because it is right skewed, uh, you know, density function. Uh, so that is the first step. Now here, clearly the values would have so high, as high as 17.61, 17.61, we located it, seems to be a problematic value. So I will mark it using the stem and leaf plot or a histogram, I can mark the first uh, potential outlier in my data. Okay, so I've marked the first potential outlier in my data. What's the next step, right? So here I'm just showing you in, in, in green circles, you have all the values which I thought when I looked at this histogram or the stem and leaf plot for the first time, which were potential outliers, things that did not agree with the larger region, the areas that did not agree. Now these outliers can come up due to different region, reasons, right? I mean, they could be because of measurement errors, uh, you know, they could be indeed be outliers by themselves, but these are troublesome values, values that should raise a red flag when we calculate the mean value, right? So if we omit all these outliers and we calculate a mean, it might be much lower than if we were to include all of them because they are all skewed in the right hand side direction or the larger percentage coal ash direction. So what it really means is that if you calculate a sample mean and if you believe it blindly, you might underestimate coal quality found in that region because the percentage coal ash or impurity will turn out to be much higher than probably what it might seem if you were to remove these five, six outlier values, especially the large one, which is 17.61, okay? All right. So detecting outliers too is analyzing the difference between the mean and the median, okay? So when we looked at the histogram, we just saw that if you have a skewed distribution, the skewness comes from some values which are sort of outside of the domain of the larger, uh, you know, large amount of data. Those are indeed our troublesome values or outliers, right? And what is the signal of a skew in the distribution? It is the fact that the mean and median are no longer the same, right? So if you have a symmetric distribution, like in bell curve for a normal distribution, your mean and median are likely to be, are going to be exactly the same. For a symmetric distribution, mean is equal to the median, right? So that is the symmetric, symmetric distribution. But in case you have a asymmetric distribution, you have something like, you know, uh, in red, or let's say you have something like in blue, then, you know, you're no longer going to have your mean and median values 
to be higher, right? For blue, you're going to have your median to be smaller than the mean and for the red, you're going to have the mean to be smaller than the median. So by comparing means and medians can help us detect outliers. You know, it will be a signal again that maybe there are some outliers in the data that we should start to worry about, okay? So first of all, uh, you know, such, so, so how does it sort of, you know, help us move beyond the histogram? I mean, the histogram could also tell me that there is a skew, right? Uh, but it's but 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 you know moving to this second step serves a couple of purposes. The first is that median is a resistant statistic, so measuring trends in data using medians is robust to any atypical observations or outliers, right? So first of all, uh, the second step tells me that maybe you should always you know summarize the median of a data set whenever you summarize the mean of it, because the mean might be. Uh, you know, uh, 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 misrepresenting or confounding uh, due to some values which are very, very high, right? For example, you know, uh, income levels in India. If you look at the mean income levels, that is the average GDP or GDP per capita, that is the mean GDP level, it might be much, much higher than the median GDP level because, you know, there are some, uh, you know, uh, individuals which may have a lot more, lot, lot more wealth than, you know, all the other uh, people in the country, right? So sometimes, sometimes, you know, mean values can be uh, misleading, right? They can mislead you about uh, the status of a given statistic that you are, or is, uh, you know, uh, 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 that you are studying. Um, so, whenever we summarize the mean, we should as best practice, you know, as, as, as data scientists, as statisticians, applied economists, uh, you know, uh, social scientists, engineers, we should always also look at the median value, okay, to get a full picture. Second, the comparison between the median with the mean signals skewness, something that we have covered before, and hence presence of atypical observations in the data, something that we have spent uh, the previous five, 10 minutes uh, thinking about. Okay, what this really is helping me to, helping me do is to build a statistic in order to infer whether or not there are, you know, atypical values in my data, right? So, what we say is that if the absolute difference, that is mean minus median, the absolute value of mean minus median is large enough, then a given sequence of spatial data points must be scanned for outliers, okay? So of course, you know, we know that mean is less than median or mean is greater than median. Both are sort of signals of trouble. But then what is it, how far should mean be from median that should signal real trouble? Right? So we want to sort of concretize this idea before we are sort of, you know, uh, you know uh, 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 before we sort of start scanning for outliers or become worried about outliers in our data, right? Even slight asymmetry will cause difference between mean and median, but maybe that's not something to worry about so much. So when you have a very large outlier, you're going to have the mean, you know, pulled away from median more and more. And after a certain point, it will be a sure shot or statistically, you know, significant signal for scanning for outliers. So what we really want to do is we want to look at mean minus median and its absolute value. Why do we look at absolute value? Because, you know, this is exactly the same as, uh, you know, median minus mean. So it won't matter which wave, is it a left skewed or a right skewed distribution, it won't matter anymore. Uh, we just want to look at the distance between the two and figure out what this value should be that should signal trouble. I mean, trouble in the sense of outlier values. Okay, so let's move forward and take a look at it. All right. So what you see on this, uh, on, on your screen now, is a, uh, you know, separate separation of row summaries 
from column summaries, right? So when we looked at this data, when I presented this data to you originally, I had said that, you know, we can, you know, if we can figure out means and medians in the east-west direction or in the northwest, uh, north-south direction, right? So now the rows are indeed the east-west directional summaries and the columns are, uh, you know, the north-south uh, directional summaries. So we look at the data, the way it's summarized is that, you know, I have I have my data and it's in its shape, in its shape, you know, exactly, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, laid out here. So it's the same exact uh, layout. What that really means is that, you know, uh, the top row, which has five, you know, crosses, which has cross, uh, you know, in the row are basically representing 8.59, 9.00, 11.86, 8.91, and 9.99, right? The second row has uh, seven crosses, is, are basically nothing but representing values, seven, you know, colash percent values in the second row of uh, the data set layout, which is 11.62, 10.91, 8.76, 8.89, 9.10, 7.62, 10 and 9.65, right? And for each row, uh, when we say row summaries, what we are doing is for each row, we are, uh, you know, uh, 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 documenting a median value, which is represented by the circle, right? And a mean value, which is, you know, uh, uh, documented by an asterisk, right? So, Wherever I see the, med the mean is greater than the median, that should, you know, signal right skew. That is, there is some value which is quite high on the right-hand side of the distribution. So let me look at the first row. I have 8.59, 9.00, 11.86, 8.91, and 9.99. Quite clearly, this value which is closer to 12 is three points higher then most of the values are two points higher than 9.99, uh, you know, which is quite a bit if you think about it, right? So three points higher than 9.99 is, uh, you know, 33% uh, higher, right? Two points higher than 10 is 20% higher. So 11.86 indeed is a value which is quite, you know, peculiar or different and quite large given that it's right besides these values on the same row you know, where we are sampling coal. You know, keep in mind, we are sampling coal, so it's earth, you know. How different will it be if you're walking on this row, row number 23, and you walk on the first two values, they come out to be 12, or uh, to be nine, closer to nine, and the third value that you walk onto is 12. Then the fourth value that you walk onto is again lower than, uh, you know, below nine. So this sort of signals that there is some peculiarity, seemingly some peculiarity about 11.86. Similarly, we will go from row to row to row to row and for each row, we are going to document the mean and the median. Wherever I see mean and median to be very, very close, those represent symmetric distribution. You know, places where I probably shouldn't worry too much, it probably seems like there is no trouble. Right? There is no worry, right? Places where we have very large differences are places that we should, you know, we should start to worry about, right? We will do the same thing in the north-south direction. Again, if I come back and look at, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, I, I'm going to start with this particular column. It only has one value, so no surprises. Mean is exactly equal to mean. Mean is exactly equal to median, right? So perfect, okay? Let's go back to the problematic value where I had 11.86, which is column number three from right, okay? Let's look at column number three from right. So I'm looking at, yeah, I am looking at a large difference between mean and the median. And if I look at this column as well, I have 11.86, that's my first step in the south direction starting from north. And as, as I take my second step, you know, I, I, I go down to 7.62, which is quite a fall if you think about it, right? Which is, which is almost a, 
uh, you know a 40 percent fall. Then I go to the next step I am and I am at the same level similar level 7.61 same level slightly higher I quite high 9.58 come back to the same level 8.64 and then 7.83 right. So this column seems peculiar and seemingly problematic. So we should we should now sort of we are now starting to sort of sense some outlier behavior by 11.8 cell right. So we are going to doing do this for each of the row right. Now we can't be looking at each median and median and mean and each row and each column one by one and it's very time consuming. Secondly whether or not the value the difference between mean and median is large enough to signal trouble well it's highly subjective on the analyst. You know if I am analyzing these data and I feel that you know the distance uh, this big uh, you know is large enough then it's highly subjective. Now when we do science we can't rely on subjectivity of the analyst right we have to come up with an objective measure which can you know provide us a uh, you know a somewhat definitive understanding of whether or not you know this much distance to say signals signals trouble okay. So that's the you know that's our uh, basic quest going forward. So when we do that you know we are going to develop a theory to be able to figure out how much difference between mean and medium, median is a large enough difference to signal outlier values. So let's say we have a sequence of data y1, y2 all the way through yn which is independently and identically distributed with pdf uh, f of y with parameters mu and sigma squared quite likely a normal distribution right I mean that's it's a Gaussian that's why we have a mean mu and a uh, you know a, a, a variant sigma squared. The sample mean is denoted as y bar and sample median is denoted as y tilde. We can write an approximate relationship between mean and median right so Cressy sort of provides uh, you know as I said this is all adapted from a chapter uh, chapter 2 of Cressy's book so you can go back and look at this relationship but this relationship really provides an analytical uh, link between the median value y tilde and the mean value y bar which we will see in a minute but it says y tilde equals population mean mu plus 1 over n summation uh, i equals 1 to n sin sgn means sin of yi minus mu. So I'm not really documenting yi minus mu but just the sign of it right. So if yi is greater than mu I just have a 1 it, it, it sign operator simply decode or codes it into 1 if they're exactly the same it codes this to be 0 if if yi is less than mu I simply have a minus 1 it doesn't matter what the quanta of yi minus mu is and in the in the denominator I have twice the frequency of the level of mu that I am uh, you know talking about the mean uh, the occurrence of mean in this distribution right okay. Now we also know so we can write the mean as uh, as just uh, the population mean y bar sample mean is equal to population mean plus 1 over n summation i equals 1 y i minus mu. Why is that well because you know summation of deviations from mean are 0. Okay. So you know in your uh, basic uh, uh, statistics course you must have learned that you know summation of deviations of from mean in any given sample will turn out to be 0 it has to be equal to 0. Okay. So y bar is simply equal to mu we are simply writing this term to be able to create a link between y bar and y tilde. Then we take a difference between mean and median right that is what we are after anyway mean minus median right. So this is the difference between mean and median and we can write it approximately as 1 over n summation i equals 1 to n the deviation from mean minus the sign of deviation from mean normalized by the frequency of the mean. Uh, the population mean itself okay. This provides us a measurable metric of y bar minus y tilde. 
what does it depend on right it depends on it's a function of the size of the data it's a function of the population mean it's a function of the frequency of the population mean right and and it's obviously a function of the yi's right so it depends on these parameters so it depends on the population uh, you know distribution parameters and the size of the sample and the values that you are attaining in a sample so this difference will will is act, is very sample specific that's the point that i'm trying to make here okay all right so uh, moving forward uh, you know when y i minus mu is gaussian gaussian means normally distributed right so if y i is normally distributed y i minus mu will also be normally distributed because mu is simply a constant right so it's, it's my y i minus mu will simply be following the distribution of y i with zero mean and the variance of exactly uh, equal to y i we can write that the variance of y bar minus y tilde right so now you know remember in the previous slide we wrote down the mathematical measure for y bar minus y tilde here we are writing the variance of y bar minus y tilde remember we said that if you have a sequence of random variables the the mean of those random variables or realizations also a random variable and it turns out so is the median so if the mean is a random variable the median is a random variable their difference will also be a random variable for every random variable we have a variance measure which pro provides us the error in estimating that value so this difference has a variance value which can be written as sigma squared over n times this factor 0.57 which provides us with a statistic u which is nothing but y bar minus y tilde divided by uh, 0.75 sigma over root n right so this 0.75 sigma over root n is uh, nothing but the square root of sigma squared over n times 0.57 right which is nothing but square root of variance of y bar minus y tilde so what we are really saying is we are defining this statistic u as y bar minus y tilde over square root of variance of y bar minus y tilde okay so this is a statistic we have a data set we have the mean from the data you have the median from the data you can calculate the variance from the data right variance of y minus y bar because you have sigma squared can come from the data n is just the size of the data set and 0.57 is just a constant so u is indeed going to be a number that you are going to be able to you know uh, uh, back out from the data so if i go back if i go back two steps uh, from here um, what i should be able to do is wherever i have a mean and a median for the row i will also have a y bar minus y tilde and i will also have a u for the row so i am going to have u i's where i are is just a representation of rows and similarly i am also going to have a y bar minus y tilde for each column and i'm going to also have u j's for different columns okay so i'm going to be able to build this statistic that is going to signal trouble when or when or not y bar minus y tilde is a large enough value okay so that's what we are trying to get at so we are now looking at u's being characterized or summarized for each row and each column so i don't have to go back and look at each of these values uh, you know uh, 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 visualize whether mean is very much diff much much farther away from the median or not and so on and so forth i can just evaluate a u and it will summarize for me you know the uh, you know statistical difference between uh, you know uh, these values now sigma squared i mean i said that you can back it out from the data it's just uh, 20 over 27 and in, into interquartile range the interquartile range is just a a difference between the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile how to get them we will just order the data from smallest to largest the 25th uh, value uh, in a you know 20 when you are the 25th step 
that is the 25th percentile when you're the 75th step it's a 75th percentile right so 25th percentile will have 25 percent data which are below this value right and 75th percentile is one where 75 percent of the data are below or lower than this uh, given value when by 75th okay so iqr is nothing but you know y75 minus y25 multiply that by 20 over 27 and you have your sigma hat now notice that u is the standardized mean median difference and whenever u is going to be greater than 3 a researcher should pay attention for outlier values so what i have done is that i have defined u to be y bar minus y tilde over square root of y bar minus y tilde and whenever i find modulus of u which is nothing but modulus of y bar minus y tilde over square root of variance of y bar minus y tilde okay the denominator is obvi ob obviously always positive the numerator may be positive or negative we are taking an absolute value so it will always be a positive number that we are looking to look at whenever this is greater than 3 we should be worried for outlier values or troublesome values right we should uh, we should start to scan for them more closely in the data okay now uh, the point is that uh, you know what it does is that if i go back to my row and column summaries i can simply you know look at the data and i can just figure out u and then mark out the rows and columns where u is greater than 3 or somewhere around that value right so that's what we are going to do next so we again have our data we are going to figure out u for 23rd row starting from the u from first row and we are going to figure out u for column the first column all the way u to the 16th uh, you know 16th column sorry it's going to be here all right this is probably the 14th column here right so we are going to figure out these view u values in a table and see whether or not they are greater than 3 okay so let's do that so here again coming from Cressy's book we have the standardized mean median difference which is standardized mean median difference basically is y tilde oh sorry y i so y bar minus y tilde mean minus median divided by variance of y bar minus y tilde square root right this difference which is just u is now outlined here so row one the u value is minus 1.54 much lower than 3 or minus 3 right so absolute value is 1.54 much lower than 3 no problem okay uh, points 0 0.40 no problem 6.12 huge problem we should be extremely worried about this particular row um, 4 minus 0.45 no problem minus 0.35 no problem 2.01 okay 0 0.56 0 0.07 0 0.63 minus 0 0.18 2.12 uh, 0 0.8 0 0.46 0 0.1 1 point something 0 0.6 1 point something 0 0.18 0 0.35 and so on and so forth uh, so I've just circled the values that I want to be careful about. So clearly we have 6.12, 6.317. I've also circled 2.87 because it's quite closer to 3. And also 2.47 because, you know, I think, you know, why not just check it out. So what I really want to now look at in my data set, I'll go back and look at rows 3 and 23 and columns uh, 5 and 12 where this 3 and 12 row 3 and column 12 are clearly problematic and uh, you know columns 5 and 23 let's pay attention to them okay so let's go and make sure we remember these values so i'm going to look at rows 3 and 23 and columns uh, i remember 12 it was i think 5 and 12 yes so 5 and 12 12 so row 3 and 23 okay so row 3 is right here 
I go through row 3, I have 9.64, 9.52, 10.06, 10 a higher value of 12.65. Okay, a candidate for an outlier. I should use my, uh, you know, uh, green color. Okay, so 12.65 is a problematic value because it's, it's lying around this region, which is, you know, in this row, everything is 9. Again, coexistence themes. How come you had such a high value and then a drop right after that? Right. Okay. So, I, so my, my row 3 and row 23 has my 11.86, right? So, this is the value that we talked about, right? I mean, if you go uh, east to west or towards south from this value, 11.86 sort of stands out, right? And that is also predicted by my, uh, you know, uh, uh, u uh, variable, okay? Columns 5 and 12. Column 5, again, it has this very high value of 17.61 and it has a high value of 12.80. I'm just going to circle them. I'm going to, I am flagging outliers so that I can look at means and medians, etc., etc. What if I were to drop these values? How will the mean change? How will the variance change? Will they be robust or not? Column 12 is again, we have, you know, 11.86. So 11.86 turns out to be a value, which if we were to just look at the stem and leaf plot, we might not found, find this value to be very problematic, right? But as soon as we move on to sort of, you know, uh, looking at this more sophisticated mean minus median based, you know, U statistic, this value which might not otherwise pop out, right, turns out to be a candidate for an outlier. This is if this points out to a, to, to a very important difference between spatial data and non-spatial data, right? In space, we are comparing the values from our neighbors and saying that, you know, look, we are sampling coal. How different are you going to be at a particular location? Can you be really different? You can have a gradient where the coal ash percentage is slowly rising towards north, or slowly rising towards south or towards east or towards west. And, you know, values on the eastern side are greater than values on the western side. It can be a trend. That's a spatial heterogeneity measure. But in a locality, do, can, do you really expect to see a very different, you know, coal sample than its neighbors? Well, probably not. And that's the concept that this U statistic is mobilizing or using to to come up to, to, to signal or guide us as researchers or statisticians or anal data analysts to this value of 11.86, which does not turn out to be, uh, you know, a value that you want to sort of leave out without attention. Okay, so let's move forward. Okay, so now we are going to look at the third, uh, you know, uh, methodology for detecting outliers. And this is uh, deep, this methodology depends on the belief of, again, on the belief of, uh, you know, uh, local stationarity. So when I say local stationarity, I am basically saying the thing that, you know, in a locality, I expect things to behave normally with respect to each other. And if I see abnormal behavior in a neighborhood, well, probably I should be uh, becoming more uh, you know, more attendant to, uh, you know, such a phenomenon, right? So what I'm looking at now, uh, you know, what I'm going to now propose as a device to do that is called as a bivariate scatter plot between Z at location S and Z at location S plus H E. Now, in spatial data, every data point is indexed by a location, right? So Z of S is simply, you know, the value at location S. So I can go to any location, any location, call it S, and the value that I see there, that is the coal ash, coal, coal ash percentage, is going to be Z of S. Right? Um, sorry about the... Okay. So the value here at location S is Z of S. Alright? Um, now, what is Z S plus H E. Now, E is called as a unit length vector with a given direction. So, A E is a vector. It has unit length. So, it is a unit long, right? When you multiply E with H, you are going to move H units 
in a given direction uh, in a given direction and this direction information is contained within the vector e right so the unit length vector the purpose or the uh, you know uh, 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 the reason that we sort of use this notation of uh, you know unit length vector is to contain the information on direction in which we want to move right h on the other hand is the uh, you know is the is the size of the hop that i want to take from uh, a given location s right so h is set to be 1 so i'm going to move one step at a time right so e will tell me okay you know if i'm standing at s i want to move one step in uh, you know uh, left so that i can get to s plus h e on the immediate cross on the left right if i go one step uh, you know south or one step you know towards the uh, downward direction i'll have my cross uh, that i go which will become s plus e e now is just south southern direction right or downward direction from the s one step uh, in that direction right so what we are going to do now is that we are going to create scatter plots in of of pairs of values where i go to it location i take one step one hop i record that location and then i create a i, I create a pair of these things right so i'm creating a pair of zs and z s plus h e and then i'm going to now present a scatter plot for these things right so so pay attention to what i just said you know i'm going to have z s it's going to be my x direction so s is in x direction uh, right x axis s plus e is in y direction so i'm moving northward right so i'm basically starting at each value in my data right so let me go back to my data set i'm going to start at 10.59 that's my z of s and i'm going to move one step further z s plus 1 right and then you know i'm going to sort of have 10.59 on the x axis and 9.59 on the y axis and i'm going to point out the coordinate right so let's do that so i have my 10.5 somewhere around here and my 9.5 somewhere 9 point something here so this is a you know approximate sort of a uh, pair of z s and z s plus e each point on this scatter plot is representation of neighborhood pairs when we move in the east west direction okay so we are moving in the east west direction so basically in that data set you know if i go back to my data set i'm moving from to 10.59 to 10.43 so i'm going to be looking at a pair between 10.59 and 10.43 right but the ultimate purpose is that when i look at a value right and i just step one step further from that value in any direction local stationarity the belief of local stationarity basically suggests that you know i shouldn't be looking at a very different value in the locality right again it's coal lying under the ground how different can you be can a value or coal ash percentage can you get if you just walk one step forward towards the eastward direction or towards the westward direction towards the north direction or the south direction it's just one hop right so whenever you know we see values that are standing out from this bivariate scatter plot right that is a signal of outliers for example the, if i if i get a value of you know when i'm standing at around 11 and i get a value of around 18 as the next step when i move one step uh, in the east west direction well i should be worried i'm looking at something very bizarre right if i go back to my data set again you know i am basically starting out at 10.87 or 10.82 and ending up on to the next top being such a large value of 17.61 right so that signals trouble so in this bivariate scatter plot whenever i see values that are outstanding which are going away from a cluster right a cluster that sort of represents a gaussian right a gaussian behavior like a bell curve there is high density in the middle and then towards the peripheries the density will die out but if you see values which are much farther away from a you know from a perceived periphery then you should mark them for outliers right we can do this in the east west direction 
we can also do this in the north south uh, direction right so in the north south direction again i am seeing the same uh, you know pattern there is a high density in the middle and as i move out in any direction the density sort of starts to die out so there is some gaussian behavior going on in every direction from the core of this bivariate scatter plot so i can sort of draw a peripheral boundary but there are some points that seem to be sort of off of this peripheral boundary right so this is the third methodology to look at scatter plots between z of at location s and z at location s plus e and these scatter plots provide us a signal of whether or not we should be worried about you know uh, 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 outlier uh, outlier values okay so we have seen three different uh, you know uh, 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 three different uh, methods of detecting out outliers right so three uh, uh, i'm going to call them three devices to detect outlier values right the first device was the i'm just going to call it a histogram we looked at a stem and a leaf plot. The second device was this U statistic, which was based on the difference between the mean and the median. And we did this row wise and column wise. Third is a bivariate scatter plot, which is sort of testing the assumption whether or not the data are locally stationary, right? So, so we mobilize this concept of local stationarity in the data we will we will spend you know we will study stationarity in detail but you get the idea of local stationarity that you know we are ultimately looking at cold data and if you are looking at cold data you know we might we, we can expect some kind of a normal behavior and as soon as we see something abnormal through any of these devices we mark it for trouble okay so so here are these, you know, these these values that I have, uh, you know, circled in blue and green, and you know, they are they are basically a, uh, you know, a union set union of the the outliers that we detected through uh, these three uh, different, uh, you know, uh, uh, exercises. I mean, there is this 12.65, which you know I actually detected uh, during the course of this lecture, uh, but I guess you know these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight values are the ones that we should we should be quite worried about right uh, going forward when we analyze these data if, whether we are predicting uh, you know uh, we, are, we are predicting in space values that we have not sampled right or we are simply evaluating the mean uh, of of coal impurities the average coal impurity in different directions in different locations sub regions in this region we should be very careful about these values what is special in this analysis that has come from this, uh, you know, second uh, U statistic is that, you know, the value 11.86 is very similar to values like, let's say, 11.62. But 11.62 does not turn out to be an outlier through all these three different, you know, devices that we, uh, that we evaluated, right? So, so, so it's, not, it's not always trivial, straightforward or something that you can simply with your naked eye just go in and look at the data and you'll be like oh here is an outlier i can look at it oh well you can do that that's a good starting point and we should always do that right as a starting point as as data analysts but we should probably you know also go one step further and work with formal devices or formal measures which will provide us an understanding of abnormal behavior in spatial uh, spatial data okay so that's it for uh, this part of, 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 of our lecture. Uh, as a next part, I'm going to uh, look at a case study where we are going to move away from this textbook data set and look at a real world data set for groundwater levels in India. And we'll see how, you know, when we move from a textbook data set to a real world data set, you know, some of the interventions are necessary before we can, you know, uh, before we can analyze this data set. So look, uh, look forward to having you again in the next lecture. Mm -hmm.